Ladies and gentlemen, generally the world over, and particularly in countries like Pakistan, we are not well aware of the maritime. And therefore, happenings at sea do not resonate neither with our public nor with the media or even the government. And piracy is no exception. Events of piracy are very few and they do not get the publicity they deserve. However, the year 2011 in Pakistan was an exception in this regard. Not only that the media gave full coverage to the phenomenon of piracy, it was literally talk of the town, and I think many in Pakistan first time heard of maritime piracy outside storybooks and movies. And of course, it was not only Pakistan, but the entire world was talking of the phenomenon, which was threatening international shipping, particularly in the Indian Ocean. However, after achieving its peak in 2012-13, the menace has gradually faded away, and today there is little talk of piracy in the Indian Ocean. In fact, during the last two years, I have not heard of any incident of piracy reported in our areas of interest. So it was a bit of surprise when I received the request to speak on the subject which is not of contemporary interest and hardly a challenge of maritime security as far as Pakistan is concerned. But perhaps it's still on the agenda of Aman, so here we are, and I'll try to uh, share my understanding of this issue. Let's start by defining the term piracy. Next. The generally accepted definition of piracy has to be the one contained in the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, where piracy is defined as, and I think you can see that, any illegal acts of violence or detention or any act of depredation committed for private ends by the crew or the passengers of a private ship or a private aircraft and directed, one, on the high seas against another ship or aircraft or against persons or property on board such ship or aircraft. Now, if you note three terms that have been highlighted on the definition. First, acts committed for private ends. So that absolves the acts committed for political ends. Then, it has to be committed on the high seas, outside the jurisdiction of any states. So which means, according to this definition, armed robberies against ships within the territorial seas are also excluded. And that is one of the reasons that many academicians and practitioners question the efficacy of this definition because, as I said, it excludes armed robbery against ship in territorial waters, in internal waters, as well as in archipelagic waters, whereas they may be carried out on international shipping. Uh, here I may add that in order to provide uh, an overall view of the global threat posed by piracy and armed robbery against ships, since 1982, the International Maritime Organization has been issuing incident reports, both monthly as well as annual comprehensive uh, reports. Uh, and even the reports uh, submitted by International Maritime Organization on piracy, they include armed robbery within territorial waters, but they mention them separately under separate headings, international waters, territorial waters, to uh, segregate the two of them. Uh, however, due substantial decline in piracy, as I mentioned since May 2018, uh, the International Maritime Organizations has stopped issuing monthly reports, and now they only uh, issue 
a comprehensive report annually. Piracy, ladies and gentlemen, or the marine piracy, is perhaps as old as the time that mankind first ventured onto the sea. And it may even be fair to say that piracy is one of the oldest crimes known to humanity. Traditionally, the term piracy only implies attacking and robbing ships. But as you can see from the definition just cited, uh, now such acts against aircraft have also been included. And then you have also heard of the term used in software piracy. So piracy has got extended meaning in nowadays world. So here you can see the traditional difference from the definition that I showed earlier, that the traditional definition included the coastal land. But here is a very interesting thing which says, without legal authority, which means that traditionally there has been legal authority also available to piracy. And therefore, historically, states saw the pirates as enemies, potential allies, or criminals. We have the examples where one state saw them as criminals, while the other celebrated them as heroes. Some countries in Europe are still celebrating Pirate Day. For example, in Germany, Klaus Stortbecker is celebrated as a hero and his statues are displayed in a number of North German cities. We also know Barbarossa, who is revered as a hero amongst the Muslims and as a great admiral of the Turkish fleet. However, majority of European historians call him a pirate. So it has remained a matter of perception as to who is the beneficiary and who is the victim. Uh, I'm sure most of you have also seen the movie Pirates of Caribbean, and we all love it. It's, it, it's a six series movie. So that is how pirates are sometimes celebrated as heroes. Pirates are also used as privateers, serving their own enrichment and the military aims of their sponsors. And this I'll link with the Indian Ocean piracy shortly. The ancient and relatively recent approach to pirates is to view them as enemy combatants engaged in military against attacks against the state and its constituents. This approach continued till the beginning of the 20th century. In general, states in the 21st century do not view pirates as enemies or allies but rather as criminals. However, we find the Somalian piracy pirates were used as proxies and or as privateers. There is this interesting story from Greek history that Alexander asked a captured pirate, how dare he molest the sea? The pirate responded, how dare you molest the whole world? Because I do it with a little ship only, I'm called a thief. You doing it with a great navy are called an emperor. So modern piracy is synonymous with Somali piracy, which thrust into public eye, as I said, somewhere in 2007-2008. It was a fact of modern life, costing the world economy from seven to $12 billion annually. And the cost was not only limited to economics, but also human, environmental, and political. So coming back to what happened in Pakistan that brought piracy into attention. A ship called MV Swiss was hijacked by the pirates off the coast of Aden in 2010. Although it was not a Pakistani ship, but the captain of the ship and four of the crew members belonged to Pakistan. And after months of detention, when the ship's owners refused to pay ransom, the 
Captain contacted his family back home in 2011, and from there, the media and the uh, uh, Ansar Bernie Trust took up the matter. The governor of Sindh showed his interest, and finally, the uh, negotiations were carried out with the captives and the crew was released after paying about $2.3 million, of which $1.3 million was raised by the family uh, of the captain from within Pakistan. That was the time when most of us became aware of the horrors of modern piracy. And this was the time when I got involved in this, because just after the saga concluded, some foreign institutions desired to have an international conference in Pakistan using the sentiments and the experience of the Pakistanis. And somehow I was asked to organize, coordinate the conference, which was held in February 2012 in uh, Karachi. And there I learned a few things firsthand from the captain of the ship, which was captured, and some other people who have been involved in the uh, operation. So most of the time, we are not aware of the uh, facts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, people have identified three business models of modern piracy. Kidnap and ransom, stealing the vessel and its cargo, or robbing valuables from vessels in short raids. And next. These are the conditions which are required by piracy to thrive. It requires a safe haven on land, access to the sea, and a weak or corruptible government. And this is very important for us. This should also have been highlighted here. Let's now discuss the origin and modalities of Somali piracy, because that is the only piracy we know in the Indian Ocean. Rest, according to our legal definition, are armed robberies that happen mostly around the coast of Gujarat in India and rarely of Bangladesh. But the hot spots are around the Malacca Strait and Indonesian archipelago. Various UN bodies and independent analysts agree with many local actors that nexus between hazardous waste dumping and illegal fishing prompted Somali piracy. Whereas waste dumping took place secretly in remote overland and maritime spaces, often under the cover of darkness, illegal fishing happened routinely, sometimes in broad daylight on and off near the Somali coast. At least since the collapse of the Somali state in the early 1991, illegal fishers plundered the country's marine resources. Illegal dumping and the intensity and methods of foreign illegal and local fishing destroyed the marine habitat, contributed to the deterioration of the quality and quantity of the catch, and further eroded the long-term sustainability of Somali fisher fisheries. Somalis directly observed and experienced the damages such illegal fishing and waste dumping caused to their environment and took the defense of their coastline and waters into their own hands and started confronting the foreign illegal vessels. Within a decade, their impromptu defensive measures took a life of its own and became the epic predatory enterprise of ransom piracy of the 21st century. From grievance to greed. But this is only part of the picture, shown to you us mostly by the West. To actually understand the phenomenon, we need to look a little bit at the history of Somalia. In 1969, the elected president, Abdul Rashid Ali, was assassinated and military took over, who earlier aligned with 
the United uh, USSR and later with the United States of America. General Syed, who took over the government, was later ousted by the famous Farah Aidi, I think you have all heard of him, in 1991. Progressive erosion of the Somali state during the military regime, the country's descent into a bitter civil war in the late 80s, and the disintegration of its government in 91 did not augur well to the safety and security of maritime navigation in its waters. Civil war in Somalia provided opportunity for, as discussed earlier, the use of Somali waters for illegal fishing and dumping of hazardous material and the rise of local fishermen in defense. But in addition to that, what is seldom spoken of, the foreign powers use the various landlords warlords as proxies to bring a regime favorable to them in Somalia. Thus they not only ignored but in some instances actually encouraged piracy by these warlords. These warlords use the pirates to earn money, smuggle weapons and use them against their rivals. So piracy actually flourished because of support from some Western powers, and I'll come back to that later. This is a case similar to that of the Afghanistan. The poppy culture is controlled when Taliban are there, and it rises further when the uh, American-led forces invade Afghanistan. Similarly, in Somalia also, if we note in 2006, for a short period when Islamic Courts Union was in control of the territory, uh, the piracy was immediately controlled. But as soon as Somalia was taken over by Western-backed forces, the piracy again flourished. So you can understand the reasons. You will be surprised to know that whenever a ship was hijacked, the first call to the owners of the ship was usually not from the pirates or hijackers, but from a middleman from UAE or London offering the owner the services to negotiate with the pirates. And if you don't ask me the source, I can tell you authentic intelligence that most of those middlemen belonged to MI. Six, the British intelligence, they were former or serving operators of MI6. Traditionally, Somali pirates have operated from small boats waiting up to 50 nautical miles off the coast for a suitable vessel to attack, but as patrols have pushed them further out, they started using bigger trawlers as motherships. The ability of pirates to locate target vessels in vast expanse of sea has led some to conclude that pirates are being provided with GPS coordinates by informants with access to shipping, ship tracking data. Crews of some hijacked vessels have said that the pirates appear to know everything about the ship on boarding from the layout of the vessel to its ports of call. Calls made by pirates from their satellite phones from captured ships indicate an international network. According to Captain Vasi Hassan of the captured ship, he had a crew of 23, but one person could not sail with the ship and was dropped at the last moment, and the pirates kept torching them to find that one person who was missing there because they had details of 23 people on board. Whatever money they earn, only a portion of the ransom money goes to the pirates. Government officials and the armed groups that control different parts of the country may also be taking a share though the precise amount is unknown. According to one breakdown, the pirates involved in the actual hijacking receive only 30% of the ransom, out of which they must cover their expenses. 
The armed groups who control the territory where the pirates are based may claim perhaps 10% as a tax, and elders and officials command a similar share. The financier of the operation may take 20% as interest on the funds advanced with a sorry uh, funds advanced with a full sponsor claiming perhaps 30%. According to a convicted pirate, a single armed pirate can earn anywhere from $6,000 to $10,000 for a 1 million ransom ship. This is approximately two to three years worth of salary of an armed guard at a humanitarian agency and much higher than what a local business would pay. The number of acts of piracy and armed robbery against ships which were reported to the International Maritime Organization in 2019 were about 193. And the areas most affected by the piracy the, and armed robbery are West Africa, the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, South China Sea, South American Pacific region, South American Caribbean region, and as you can see, Indian Ocean had the minimum of the incidents, and none of them uh, Somali piracy, and out of these 10 incidents, only one happened in the international waters of Indonesia. Uh, seven of them actually happened on the anchorage. These are figures for one year. These, the, these are the figures of only 2019. Uh, as I said, they issue now annual reports. The annual report of 2020 is still awaited, but I have gone through the, uh, their monthly reports. Uh, there is, again in 2020, also there is no reported piracy in the uh, Somali region, only these armed robberies of the Malacca coast and a couple of them of the uh, Gujarat coast of India. Uh, now coming to the second part of uh, the requirement, the way forward. Now, although I have said it's not of an imminent threat because it is not happening, and one thing perhaps that I forgot to mention is that the pirates were also smart enough not to attack any national shipping. So they were only attacking selected ships of private companies. Uh, but once it has happened, it may happen again, and we should be prepared for that. So what are the measures that can be uh, taken? OK, this is starting from the measures. This is, again, as I mentioned, the former president of Somalia, he had noted that you cannot tackle piracy from the sea, no matter how many naval ships you put into the waters. The best way to actually fight the piracy is to tackle these things from the land. And so, from my point of view, as is my point of view for many other ills, I think we have to start from improving the governance. In my opinion, the panacea to all ills is political stability and good governance. But some specific uh, measures that can be taken as far as maritime security is concerned, and these measures are not limited to piracy, but they will help achieve overall uh, maritime security. Uh, for example, the role and capacity building of maritime security agency and Coast Guard be enhanced so that they can be used as primary agency dealing with maritime security issues. Intensified patrols in the respective area of responsibility with an emphasis on maritime support operations, including maritime interdiction operations. 
setting up of command and control centers with appropriate equipment and the force to respond to, con to contingencies such as armed hijackings and piracy. Integrated surveillance and information network for tracking and investigating suspicious movements. Random escorts of high value merchant vessels plying the dangerous straits and adjacent waters. Of course, it will be required when there is a threat, but we have to keep practicing these and the Navy keeps doing that. Redesignation of shipping routes to minimize the convergence of small craft with high risk merchant vessels improved ship tracking devices, and last but not the least, international and national security standards and programs such as International Ship and Port Facility Security Code be implemented effectively. Now to conclude, over the past 200 years, humanity has undertaken many joint initiatives in almost every field health, education, communication, even the unprecedented cooperation between more than 190 states under the banner of the United Nations. Never before history have we had such a large number of treaties, conventions, rules and regulations to enforce order, discipline and cohesion on this planet. And yet we find that in the 21st century, Marine piracy makes a virtual mockery of this 200 years of phenomenal progress. This illustrates the incredible vulnerability of, uh, vulnerability of our systems, in some cases, very complicated systems, which we need to improve. Maritime regimes need to be developed to bring order to the oceans and seas of the region. Maritime cooperation is a major component of the regime building process and is essential for the effective management of regional seas, especially marine environmental protection, marine safety, resource management, and preventing illegal activities at sea. And before leaving, I want to leave a slide which quotes the captain of that ill-fated ship, the Pakistani captain, and I'll just leave it for you to read it and try to understand how such criminal activity takes place at such a scale in the 21st century. Thank you very much.